So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, glad to be with you today. Thanks, Joanna, for that great introduction. Um, I wanted to start with that video because I thought it was a pretty important context for the conversation that you've been having this morning and really for the tone for where I think we are as a country. Um, so that's a, a documentary that was done a couple of years ago looking at an, an effort in, in Chicago. It used to be called Cure Violence. I'm not sure, just by a quick show of hands, how many folks have heard of the uh, ceasefire? It was called ceasefire initially, and it's now called Cure Violence. Uh, and there are two ceasefire models. There's one in Boston, there's one in Chicago, so it could be pretty confusing in terms of what you're talking about, which is why they renamed the Chicago one Cure Violence for clarification. But I thought the video, while it was promoting a model in Chicago uh, captured a tone and a context for where I think we are as a country. Uh, and you heard the comment that was made by one of the men in the community that we're sick and tired of this happening in our community, can't take it anymore, right? And there is that level of sick and tiredness, right? That, you know, for us as citizens in this country about what we've been seeing, um, about what we need to do about it. It really captures, I think, uh, the tone for where we need to go. And as we're asking the questions, what do we do about it? What do we do about it from an academic standpoint? What do, you, what do we do about it from a policy standpoint? What does it look like? What does success look like? How do we no longer be sick and tired of being sick and tired? Right? And I think that's the context for me as, as I reflect for you and share with you the work that we've done at the National League of Cities. So quickly, National League of Cities is a membership-based organization, so we work with mayors. We work with city council members across the country, uh, and they serve in leadership roles within our organization. Uh, so our, the current mayor, the current president of the National League of Cities is a mayor from Salt Lake City, Mayor Becker, Ralph Becker. Our incoming president uh, is the city council member from Joplin, Missouri, Mayor Melody uh, Barnes. Col I mean, Mayor Melody Colbert King, Melody Barnes was White House uh, staff person. Um, and so we're a membership-based organization. We work uh, with cities ac across the country. So our membership is about 1,900 cities. Uh, but we also work with state leagues. So every state except Hawaii, unfortunately, does not have a, has a state league. And so through the state leagues, we serve as a membership base to 19,000 cities. Right? So as an organization, its reach is incredible. It's been around since 1924. Uh, and so I've been at the National League of Cities for 10 years, and I've had the opportunity to really figure out how do you maximize that reach in the stuff that I care passionately about. As you heard from Joanna, uh, my, my focus really came into this work with a passion about engaging young people, youth development, and I bring that to everything that I do. And so within that context, I wanted to really set the tone with this image about where we were five years ago as an organization when I was working within the Institute for Youth Education and Families, uh, that uh, when we were asked as an organization to uh, engage our membership uh, to explore their leadership uh, to promote black male achievement. Right? So if you think about five years ago, we were not really having conversations about boys and men of color, black men and boys. Uh, it, was a, it was a kind of a budgeting field uh, with uh, the campaign for black male achievement at the Open Society Foundation that was really starting to engage people across the country. So I was skeptical. I came in, you know, given all the work that we did, you know, you heard the childhood obesity work, our disconnected youth work, our violence prevention work. You know, my sense was, as diverse as my membership was, we were good at talking about the problem in code words, right? We could talk about vulnerable youth, right? We could talk about disconnected youth. We could talk about those neighborhoods, et cetera. But to call out specifically race and gender and to be explicit about it, I was like, hmm. You know, we can start and engage in this conversation, but I don't think that's going to go very far. So we started out in that conversation. And what I learned at the time five years ago reflects this diagram that's on the screen, right, which is that at the top of this engagement effort with city leaders across the country, they were exactly what I thought. Very few mayors, city leaders across this country that were talking about black men and boys, right? The, the one that you know, that really stood out for us was Mayor Nutter in Philadelphia. Five years ago, for those that were kind of keeping up with YouTube, he had this non-PC moment at his church. There were some flash mobs happening in Philadelphia. Uh, he got caught on video because his pastor asked him to be able to speak, and he, he started calling some of these kids knuckleheads and sick and tired of this, and, you know, we need to do X, and parents need to be responsible, government needs to be responsible, and, you know, obviously that creates a backlash at some level, but it also empowered him to realize, I have a platform. 
reform. And so he started to do a number of things five years ago to really call out specifically issues related uh, to black men and boys. So we saw very few of the mayor nutters five years ago in the world. Uh, but then we also were seeing more mayors that were taking this on um, around a boys and men of color framework. The most infamous was the richest mayor in the country at the time, uh, and probably ever will ever be the richest mayor in the country, Mayor Bloomberg in New York City. Right? And so he put $30 million of his own pocket cash. Uh, George Soros put $30 million of his, another billionaire with Open Society Foundation. Uh, and off New York City went with their Young Men's Initiative, really talking about what they can do as a city to really target um, strategies to improve outcomes for boys and men of color. So we were paying attention and engaging with the city to really understand what this was looking like, how do we engage. Uh, but there were many more cities that were in the bottom two spaces, right? There were many more cities that were talking about it from a place-based approach, you know, promised neighborhoods, the, you know, the targeted neighborhood approach, you know, Mayor Orla uh, Buddy Dyer in Orlando was doing a lot of good work that we were, uh, that we were seeing. And then, you know, a lot more, a lot more were talking about it, again, code words in issue, around issue areas. Oh, we're talking about the dropout crisis, these dropout factories. Or we're talking about fatherhood issues, or we're talking about unemployment issues. And I remember sitting down with Mayor Barrett in Milwaukee uh, about the work that they were doing around fatherhood. And he was telling me, Leon, you know, I call it the fatherhood initiative, but we really are targeting black fathers, right? So it's our code word, right? But, but as we're doing it, we're very clear and very focused about what we are doing. So that helped me understand where I me my membership was. I was fine with that, right? As we understood kind of where we were, how we think about this work, how we engage, how we support local elected officials in really advancing this work. But a lot has happened in five years, right? From a National League of Cities perspective, we have learned a whole heck of a lot, right? And some of it um, is anecdotal, as you saw from the interrupters, right? Understanding the emotion and, you know, the sick and tiredness, as you heard from in that documentary that exists across the country. But a lot of it is also data driven that we as a field are seeing, right? And one of those areas uh, that really elevated a body of work that we started uh, leading that I want to talk to you about is called Cities United, that looks specifically at reducing violence and violent deaths among black men and boys. And the data didn't lie. So we looked at homicide rates across the country, city after city, Baltimore, Boston, Buffalo, Chicago, Cleveland, Columbus, Ohio, Houston, Latino men and boys, Indianapolis, Jackson, Mississippi, Kansas City, Missouri, Los Angeles, Latino men, Memphis, Minneapolis, Newark, Oakland, Philadelphia, Seattle, St. Louis. Looked at 184 cities across the country with homicide rates of one per 100,000. And what we saw was, to me, quite compelling and quite shocking that a disproportionate number of African-American men and boys were dying in cities across the country, and it wasn't even close. We're talking 60, 70, 80% of our homicide rates in cities across the country were black men and boys. And we were not even talking about this at the National League of Cities. And so Mayor Nutter from Philadelphia, who was really out front on this, Mayor Landrew in New Orleans, and a number of other partners launched Cities United. And there was this quote from Dr. John Powell uh, that when he was at the Kerwin Institute in Ohio State that was pretty compelling for us as we started understanding how, why this is important, why we look at the data and it's important for us as an organization to understand the need to be targeted. Right, and to call out and be explicit. And so Dr. Powell has this term called false universalism, targeted universalism. Not sure anyone in this room, I see a couple of nodding heads that have heard of it. And so he would uh, suggest in his work, armed with this knowledge, armed with the data, we still, in as many communities, take this very universal approach to our violence prevention strategy, our education strategy, our unemployment strategy. We still take this universal approach to how we think about programming and evaluation. And so this universal approach that Dr. Powell uh, talk, talks about are not sensitive to the needs of the particular. They tend to have an uneven impact, right? Because we're not being explicit about it. So he calls it false universalism. False universalism assumes that targeted policies that address the needs of certain populations become this divisive wedge. I think that's where we are as a country, right? That's why we don't want to touch it, because of that division. 
right? And it also assumes that everyone benefits from universal approaches. So he's like, if I stay universal, I know I care about this work. Maybe if I just talk about it, about the stuff that I care, everyone will benefit, right? If I just talk about it, about unemployment or poverty. But universal approaches that are not sensitive to the needs of the particular are not truly universal. Right? They, they tend to have this uneven impact, as we've seen, and researchers, researchers in the room can acknowledge this, right? And can even exacerbate racial inequality at times, right? So targeted universalism is that bottom part that we talk about, that Dr. John Powell talks about, is that we want to be universal in our goals, but not in our process, right? Targeted universalism is that we want to have universal goals, but not in the strategy, Right, as we're thinking about policy and change. And so Cities United is an example of mayors really understanding how to take this targeted universalism approach. Right? And so the belief statement, I like putting this up because this belief statement of Cities United was created before the George Zimmerman, was created before stuff we've seen uh, from Ferguson and beyond. And our mayors collectively with our partners created this statement. Right? Black Lives Matter has taken on its own kind of hashtag. Right? But I'm proud of our mayors, right, as they were articulating their commitment to this work, that this is what they put up, right? That we believe that African-American men and boys matter and are assets, right, to our nation, which should not be squandered. The mission statement of Cities United is that there is a commitment to really create strong networks locally that bring together a diverse range of stakeholders to really be committed in a dedicated way to see the reduction of violence and violent related deaths among African American men and boys. The vision statement is that by 2025, 500 mayors across the country will be engaged in this work and will be partnering with the community uh, to really strengthen the strategy locally, and that we will see a 50% national reduction among those that, that data points that we're seeing across the country. And so uh, the partners are pretty diverse in this work. I mentioned Mayor Nutter and Mayor Landrieu. For those that follow local mayor politics, they like to call themselves the ebony and ivory of this issue. Uh, one is a black mayor, one is a white mayor. Mayor Nutter that's a black mayor likes to say that Mayor Landrieu was ebony and he's ivory. If you, if you hear Mayor Landrieu talk about this, he's an incredibly passionate mayor on this issue given what's happening in his city in New Orleans. But there are a number of other partners in this space. There are foundations that are at the table. Uh, there are uh, our partnerships with the other uh, national affiliates like the Association for Black Foundation Executives and U.S. Conference of Mayors. But there also is an intentionality about engaging millennials, about engaging young people and their voices. And that's a really important theme for me, particularly as I talk again about my focus and passion about youth development and how that gets infused in the work that we do. Uh, there's a framework that we use in Cities United. You can go to citiesunited.org to, to read more about the framework and read more about the initiatives. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time going through each of the points, but it's referred to as 14 down and counting. It started that way because that, frame, that framework really acknowledged a data point that we saw through the Center for Disease Control that every 24 hours we lose 14 young men to gun violence in this country every 24 hours we lose 14 young men to gun violence i mean i just have to pause and process that when we talk about epidemics and the lack of acknowledgement of what's happening in our country we have moments that are happening from Aurora to, San, uh, um, to Newtown to things that we're seeing. And these are moments where we're losing massive people at one time. But every day, we're losing 14 young men. Now it's like 13 or 12. I can't remember what the number is. But still 12 every day as a country to gun violence. And so for us, it created and reminded us of the urgency. Dr. King talks about the fierce urgency of now. Right? And the need that as we are coming together and bringing these mayors together, that this is not just another initiative. We're losing lives. I had another statistic that Dr. Bell, the, uh, the president and CEO of Casey Family Programs, reminds us of this urgency is uh, every 15 days, we lose 435 people to, to, to homicide, to suicide, neglect, or abuse. I mean, we just throw out these numbers as if it's nothing. 
435 people every 15 days. What is 435? Uh, another example of a number where we know 435 in DC political science people. Talk to me. Y'all are like shy. What is it? Congress, right? We lose Congress every 15 days, which we probably need to lose in DC. <laughs> Right? But, it's, but we lose Congress essentially every 15 days. Right? And so it reminds us of the urgency of why and what we need to, because clearly what we're doing is not working. And if I'm going to another, going to another meeting, to another conversation to talk about the same thing or there's no action oriented. And, and so that's Dr. Bell's like, what do we do today to save a life? One of those lives. And we all come at it from different vantage points. But what did we do today to save one of those 14 young men that, gun, that gets gunned down someplace in this country? Or one of those 100, 435 that we lost due to homicide, neglect, abuse, suicide? That, for me, reminds me of the urgency of how I spend my time as I engage in this work. Right? So the 14 down and counting lays out things that mayors need to do. Right, both from a process standpoint, there's a need to create political will, and mayors have a ability to be able to do it, but there's also a need to be able to respond in a very actionable way to policy, whether we're talking about improving educational attainment, or dealing with mental health issues, or expanding job opportunities, or strengthening families. Right, there is a need to take on policy and strategies, and, and many in the room come at it from the vantage points. Right, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about how we are engaging in this work, but here's what for me, from that pyramid that I shared with you earlier to where we are five years from now, 76 mayors across the country. You see highlighted in red, Charlottesville. 76 mayors across the country are a part of Cities United. And it's as diverse as it comes, regionally, demographically, everything, politically. Right, so my skepticism, willing to acknowledge, right, is not validated here, right? That I'm seeing mayors literally across in my membership that understand the importance of how this is showing up in their cities and, and, and in their communities. And that's important and it does raise a lot of questions for us and what do we do about it, right? Because they've joined, which is awesome, right? But there's an accountability piece and it's how do we help you and how do we know that we move beyond being sick and tired of what we're seeing in cities across this country. Right, and so that gives you a little bit of sense of Cities United. And the other initiative that allows us to go a little bit deeper in this space is an initiative that we launched actually before Cities United, but actually is um, happening concurrently with that effort. And it was really uh, an opportunity that after we produced the action guide that Joanna mentioned on city leaders to promote black male achievement, the National League of Cities issued a call for proposal to cities across the country to apply to receive technical assistance from the National League of Cities to promote a black male achievement agenda in, in, in their communities. And the model of technical assistance is, is something we have a rich history of doing at the National League of Cities across all the youth development work I've done in the past and, 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 and education and et cetera that we do through the Institute. So we took uh, obviously that framework of where we have a strong expertise and put out a proposal for cities to apply to receive TA if they really, if it's for us to get a sense of where cities were in really trying to advance this work. And this was before the 76 mayors, right? This was me uh, as an organization trying to meet our deliverables for foundation that said we needed to find th three to five cities to work with. So I was just holding my breath, hoping I could find five cities to work with. And this was about four years ago. And we had over 30 applications, right? Again, before all the national attention. Uh, and this was the framework of the proposal. We asked cities to talk, share with us the leadership's commitment in your community, either currently or your desire to really frame and raise visibility on your efforts to advance a black male achievement agenda in your city. That was the first component of the proposal that we reviewed. The second was understanding the commitment that the city is currently making or looking to make to really invest in the kind of structure that needs to exist to really uh, advance this work in improving life outcomes for black men and boys. The third was data, right? And, and you know, data for us is critical in the work we do across our youth development field and, and obviously here as well. How are you um, effectively utilizing data to really measure success, understand impact, um, really think about really cross-system strategies that need to exist? 
The fourth was a commitment for us to acknowledge, and, and, you, and you, when you do this work long enough, you know that the, most people gravitate to talking about the best program in the world. Right? Every city I go to, then without fail, there's probably one conversation I have with somebody that tells me about their program. Right? And so that's great, but that's not where you start if you're really trying to take on large, comprehensive, complex challenges. So if we're talking about improving life outcomes for black men and boys, what is a commitment to implementing a comprehensive set of strategies right, for these, for these young men? And then the, the last one, uh, while not the least, but significant for us as we were assessing cities we wanted to work with, was a commitment that the city was making to effectively and authentically engage young men in this process. So we reviewed the 30 applications, and we were only were supposed to select maximum five. I just couldn't see ourselves doing that. I know we didn't have the resources capacity-wise to do it, so we partnered with the Policy Link, a uh, national organization based out in Oakland, to work and select 11 cities. Uh, and so as you can see on the screen, one of those 11 is right here, uh, which is why I love coming back to really have a chance to uh, remind and, and, and re-engage folks here and the work that they're doing on the ground. But the diversity of those cities are pretty, pretty, pretty broad. Right? From large cities like Chicago and Philadelphia to West Coast cities, East Coast cities, Central cities, you know, even surprising cities like Omaha, Nebraska, right? which was surprising to me. I had to acknowledge, like, you know, they got black people in Omaha. Right? So, it's, you know, so it was surprising for us that we had a diversity of, of cities that were there. But if you look at the, the list of cities that are up on there, how many of the mayors, any guesses? Don't be as quiet. Maybe show of hands. How many of the mayors are black? Any guesses? How many people say all, all 11? How many people say maybe five or more? How many people say between three and five? How many people say under three? How many people say zero? So there are two, right? Mayor Nutter, I mentioned, right? Philadelphia. And Mayor Brown, Mayor um, Alvin Brown in, in Jacksonville. Right? The first African-American mayor elected in Jacksonville, actually. Um, and so the diversity was surprising to us, right? And you even had a Tea Party Republican mayor Mayor Stothert proudly is a Tea Party Republican mayor in Omaha. Right? And so for me, from a membership standpoint, we always, always think about the diversity of this work. And, and that drives in terms of how we support cities in really taking on meaningful, uh, meaningful strategies around the work we do. Um, and so that was really what uh, was important for us as we were engaging a diverse range of cities. And so um, the work we did offered a youth development framework. And everything that I've done at the National League of Cities, this has been my framework. Um, and and, and it's, it's youth development, it's strategic planning one-on-one, it ain't rocket science. It's hard, um, but it's important to go in with a framework, right? And so, and I wanna share with you for us uh, how that has guided the work we do. But you know, we talk with cities about the importance of having the uh, articulation of a shared vision, the need to be able to engage a diverse range of stakeholders, the need to talk about and be committed to strategies first before programs, uh, the need to have shared accountability, uh, and the need to have core infrastructure to do this work. And I'm gonna talk about each of them. But for, for folks that have been in this space, this ain't new. Right? This, this, for me, this table that one of my colleagues did back at NLC reminds us that we've been talking about this since I don't even know when. Right? How many folks have heard of collect, collective impact? Right? How many folks knew that there was collective impact before there was collective impact? Right? This got branded. Right? Did this Ready by 21, I, and I used to work at the Forum for Youth Investment. Right? And it's a great model. But it ain't new, new conceptually. We're talking about same thing, Strive, another model in Seattle, in, uh, not Seattle, in Cincinnati, right? We talk a lot about Strive. So it's important, particularly as we meet cities where they are, to really help them know we're not asking you to start over again. If you're taking one of these models, let's build on it, right? Let's figure out how we are not going back to the table. It's like, oh, we need to adopt a, a black male achievement model. No, if you're doing Ready by 21, we can engage at that level and figure out how well you're doing to advance your positive youth development strategy in your city and who's benefiting and who's not. Let's start with where you are, 
as we're engaging in this work. And so as we're talking about the, uh, the framework, the vision piece, and from a youth development standpoint, here's kind of for me, from my both uh, from my work in national cities, cities and beyond, what really helps me understand as we're working with cities what we're talking about. This common shared vision is a really hard thing to do, right? Um, most cities that say they have a vision statement, if you're trying to, for it to be shared, my measure of whether you have a shared vision statement is not that I'm just talking to the mayor who created it, is I'm talking to the young person in the community that didn't even know that you had a shared vision. Right? And so how do you create a vision that everyone is owning and promoting? What are the key terms that you're using? How does it reflect the full breadth of what we want for every one of our young people? Right? And so there's a lot we've learned about key terms, catchy phrases. There's got to be something that people remember. Right? Not the, the long, sorry, I know at University of Virginia, academic way of capturing everything you think needs to be in there that that you are probably the only one that remembers, but you probably forgot a year from year later, right? So it's catchy, right? That, that really drives kind of why we're doing it and also captures the urgency, right? Of that 14 young men dying every 24 hours, right? And so I was once academic too. And so this was my academic <laughs> definition of youth development. Now I still remember it. Most other people don't remember it. Right? As I talk about what every young person needs, is that all communities need to ensure, and you can test if I'm looking at the screen or not, that throughout the developmental years and throughout their waking hours, all children and youth need a constant access to a range of services, supports, and opportunities, another youth development term we use a lot, in the settings where they spend their time, but also that response to their challenges, their, their, their connections and other needs in order for them to be well prepared, whatever that well prepared is. We, there's a whole lot of literature about well prepared, whether it's the five C's or we're talking about, you know, college work in life, which is a term that, ready, uh, that, that when I was at the Forum for Youth Investment, we came up with. Right. But also to acknowledge that not everyone uh, can do that very easily. Everyone has some additional challenges, whether we're talking about racial equity or poverty or et cetera, and the need to be able to address that. Did I get that all right? Kind of. I didn't even look at it. You test. I didn't look, right? It's all right. So that's, but most, most people don't, won't remember that. That drives me as I look at this work, right? And I understand that it has core components to it. It's important to have that framework. So, and I still bring that to me, uh, to me as I do the work. But, you know, how do you take that common vision and embed it in the work, right? And so as we're talking with Chicago, right, Chicago is taking their Thrive model and trying to do that. And Omaha with their transformation initiative and even in Philadelphia with their commission that the mayor launches, uh, examples of taking a broader vision and trying to figure out how it gets embedded in the work that they're doing. Stakeholders is another, another one of those second components in a space that when I travel a lot, I uh, can't tell you the number of times that I uh, go into communities and they say, we work well together. We all get along. We all share and we kind of know what's going on. It's like, oh, really? Um, I was like, so how, how, how is that working for you? Like, uh, are you, um, do you have the young people at the table? Well, well, we need to figure out how to find more opportunities to engage them. Have you figured out a way to engage the business community? Well, we haven't exactly learned how to do that, right? And so there's always these additional well moments that they haven't really fully got it right. But everyone's quick to say we work well together. It's hard work, right? And I find myself spending more time on these first two spaces in communities if I'm really trying to push them. Uh, before we jump to anything else, right? Because at the end of the day, when we're talking about engaging stakeholders, there are different sectors that need to be at the table, right? There are different systems that are involved in this work that need to be at the table, right? We're, we're talking about people that are high level and mayors and superintendents and police chiefs. You're talking about middle level managers. You're, you're talking about people on the ground that are connected to this work. And how are you creating a process that manages this, right? Where in the center is the youth, not you. And then you're a part of that web that's trying to figure out how we are working well together on behalf of youth, not you. And that's hard work, right? Most cities struggle with this and it's ongoing even when cities get it, it needs constant reflection. Uh, an assessment about how well you're doing. And then thinking about young people in that process by itself is a body of work, a lifetime of work, 
right? And, and Joanna mentioned a publication we put out a few years ago on authentic youth civic engagement. ACE is what we call it, ACE, the ACE framework. And quickly it summarizes the authentic youth civic engagement in this diagram. That as we're talking about engaging young people, you got to create a, a welcoming environment, right? Where they have the setting, where you're authentically bringing them into the space, right? And then not what you call, what my friend in Chicago, Mick for Challenge calls vending machine participation, right? Where you find the right young person to fit your moment and then you send them on their way. Right? So you have to create the welcoming environment where you acknowledge them, you're investing in them, you're promoting the importance of it. And if you're not good with doing that with the community, there's no way you're thinking about young people. Right? So there's a larger civic engagement conversation about how well as a city you're committed to engagement. And that's a power dynamic, as we all know. Right? And so there's the setting. Uh, and then there's also, we also talk about the importance of supports. You can see there's a kind of a theme with the S's going on, right? So creating adult allies, for those that are in this space know about that, right? How do we see uh, adults as bridge builders or as my dissertation advisor, Barry Checkaway in Michigan calls them, colleagues in a common cause, right? And that's hard for adults. Colleagues, not recipients, not, not, not service recipients, but colleagues in the same cause we're fighting. And how do you create that, those, that, those levels of supports? That, that's a resource investment for cities. Where's the staff for that? And then the structures and participants, but strategies are the other S's. Like what environments are you creating for young people to have a chance to, to be engaged? Not every young person wants to serve on a youth council. And I, I, someone made the comment earlier about youth councils. There are a lot around the country right now. We, do, we work with a lot. But not all of them are following necessarily authentic youth civic engagement. They are engaging them, maybe in vending machine, service projects, right? Let's do a service projects together. But authentic engagement, right? Some people, some young people want to be an opportunity to have a, a role in decision making and policy making, right? Not every adult wants to run for mayor, right? So what are you creating opportunities for young people to have their voices, right? And how is that a part of your strategy as you're moving forward? And so that work for us on the ground is critical, right? And, and so just examples as, you, as we're doing the work that's, you know, that's happening, you know, with uh, bringing together a diverse range of stakeholders, Fort Wayne, their partnerships, Louisville, Oakland, Philadelphia, each of them, you know, there's good work happening on the ground as we're thinking about ways of the, the both bringing organizations together, bringing structures together, uh, bringing young people together, which still remains an ongoing challenge for many cities because it's an ongoing process that you need to be committed to. Uh, the strategies piece, right? So after you kind of spend some time on that vision and stakeholders, what are you going to do for to really advance a black male achievement agenda? And for us, you know, the, the, the reflection of our work that we did early on in our municipal guide focused on four areas, really three, but we've expanded obviously because of our cities united on violence and violent deaths. But it focused on uh, um, expanding job opportunities and improving educational attainment and strengthening families and reducing violence and violent deaths among black men and boys. And we were building on work that we were seeing around the country from Milwaukee's work. I mentioned Mayor Barrett and the work that he was doing on fatherhood to when Mayor Booker in Newark was doing work around his um, career academies, um, educational attainment work to Mayor Rawlings Blake to the work that she's doing around a lot of workforce development work that was happening in Baltimore and also Mayor Landrew and, and, um, and Mayor Nutter uh, and th their work that they were committed to around violence and violence prevention. And so for us, our success is really identifying mayors that have some good foundation to build on. It doesn't mean that they got it right, but it's a good starting point to really figure out how you use that to really build on the kind of strategies that are needed. But, but also when you talk about strategies, and this is me putting back on my youth development hat, is really understanding the importance of cross systems strategies. Right? And there was a study done by Margaret Dunkel uh, looking at one family in Los Angeles County. She looked at a family roughly about six or seven. Uh, she mapped kind of the, the systems that are in the lives of the families and she looked at the programs that those families received and then she tried to figure out what they were navigating. And this is what she found in just one family, right, in Los Angeles County. And that uh, reflects when we talk about the role of cities and we talk about the role of mayors and elected officials, what we're talking about, right? And, it's, and it might be funny to see, but this is the lives that people are living, right? And particularly as we're starting to talk about the disproportionate number of communities that are navigating this and what we've created for them, right? And, and so that cross-system strategies work is hard work, 
requires leadership, right? Because at the end of the day, we're asking people that these are people that are employed in these systems and you're coming to them to try to change business as usual. That's not easy, changing norms, right? Changing attitudes, right? Getting people to overcome the procedures that they're just used to. This is the way we always do it. Right? So it is hard work, but there there's needs to be a commitment. If we're going beyond the programs and going beyond the we always do it this way and, and really focus on we're sick and tired of doing business as usual, there's got to be a need to take on the cross-systems strategies work right? without doing this, right? which is create another task force, go to another meeting, right? And then go to another meeting later after that, right? We have a lot of examples, and this is in Rochester. It could be here in Charlottesville, right? Many people find themselves going to another meeting to talk about the same problem and seeing some of the same people at the same meeting, right? But you fill your day with that. And then you think we're doing something when we just lost 14 young people that day, someplace, right? The urgency is not there in terms of figuring out how we do this, stop doing business as usual in this way, right? And so we push cities in this space, right? We push them to really look at those cross-system strategies and, you know, and then to examples again, just of the cities and the work that's happening, both from a place-based approach, um, you know, to work that's happening citywide, um, as well as work that's taking on a larger effort around boys and men of color. Um, and then shared accountability. Uh, you know, this is, you know, after you kind of get to a space where you're clear about a vision, you're clear about the strategies, how do you hold each other accountable about what you're trying to do? And that accountability space needs clarification on common language, data points, indicators, right? And a system that, that is holding yourselves accountable. And this diagram, again, when I was at the Forum for Youth Investment, for me captures the larger work that they're doing around these data dashboards uh, that they're creating in communities that help measure where you are and where you're looking to go, right? As we think about what we know in the field, right? We know there are things that are working. Those are the green areas. We know things that are not working that well, um, but are still progressing. Right? Those are the yellow areas and the red, we're not, we're not touching it. We're not doing as well as we should. Right? Accountability is assessing where you are and where you're going. How are you moving the reds to yellow or greens and making sure the greens are not going to yellows or reds? Right? How are you creating that common language that allows you to be able to do that? And this is hard work because again, when I go into communities, there is a, a sense of we need to start, we need to talk about what this should look like. And my pushback to them is like, there's a field of practice, right? We spent years, 25 plus years. Karen Pittman is, for me, the godmother of youth development, right? The National Research Council, now, to, now over 10 years ago, all the great minds came together and talked about what assets do young people need. We don't need to ask ourselves that question again, do we? Or do we need to do another research project on that? Right? We know what assets young people need, right? We know the physical development, the intellectual, you know, so, uh, psychological, uh, social, and, and, all, and then we've done a really good job of breaking all those down to create the indicators. Do, what more do we need to do? And you could obviously push back in that space for me, but what more do we need to do to really help cities move to action, right, as we're talking about holding each other accountable? And in fact, we also know that services supports an opportunity space in youth development. I can't tell you, I still keep reading articles about talking about what the services supports and opportunities are for young people. This, I was like, they did a great job 12 years ago. And it captured it so well. These are all the spaces that young people need to be thriving. They need physical, psychological safety. They need to have appropriate structures. They need to have supportive relationships. They need to feel like they belong, opportunities to belong, social norms, efficacy, mattering, skill building, right? right? We look at all these things, right? And think about what gangs are for our kids. They offer them all of this, except for the positive social norms, right? And so we're fighting that while we created that spaghetti map of those systems for them to be living in. And then we're trying to figure out what else we need to add to that space, right? And so it's important to have common language in that space as we're moving, or Omaha is a great example of that. And the final one is the infrastructures, right? And so within the infrastructure, it's really important of figuring out where does this live? 
right? Because a lot of communities go through plans, and after the plan is done, there's no commitment in the city or in the community to figure out how you implement it. Right? And so we talk a lot about that as we work with cities. And so uh, the framework is pretty comprehensive. right? And we talk a lot about the importance of staying in those first two areas and the importance that a local elected officials play. We call it the five C's and the P, just as a catchy way of remembering it. right? But the role that elected officials play to conceptualize and convene and commission and to promote, et cetera. Right? And it gives us a helpful way as we're thinking about how elected officials lead in this space. But as we've been doing all this work, this issue of, of race and equity has really been elevated, right? And, and I wanted to start with a video that gives you a little bit of context, and then I'll give you a little sense of where we are, and hopefully then wrap up with some questions and answers. <laughs> so uh, th that's our executive director, Clarence Anthony. Uh, you heard from uh, Tim Wise, who is an anti-racist activist in Nashville, Southern Jewish, uh, and gave some context for NLC launching Real, where I serve as the inaugural director, and the importance of really taking the work that I shared with you earlier and the need and the acknowledgement as an organization for us to be significantly more explicit about it. Uh, and so REAL stands for Race, Equity, and Leadership. Uh, it acknowledges, obviously, the stuff that has happened over the last year from Ferguson and beyond, what at one point seemed to be stuff happening every two weeks, uh, and cities that were wrestling with this as this issue of race, racial equity was as, at the doorsteps of communities, uh, particularly City Hall. It acknowledges, as we're talking about race and equity, this quote by Rick Riordan, that equity for us is a, there are terms that need to be clarified, right? Equity doesn't mean that everyone gets the same. Equity means people get what they need. Right, um, and so as we're talking about the work, we realize this is not a new new issue. We've been talking about race in in America for a very long time. It's definitely a new opportunity, and the need for us as a country to really take on some really critical questions around implicit and explicit bias in our individual lives, in our communities, in our policies, in our procedures, in our budgets, and the need to build on and what's great about the field of practice that's out there. Uh, and so for us, the mission of our organization uh, as we've launched Real is that we are a strong strengthening the capacity of leaders, local elected officials, uh, in addressing the impact of race and equity in their communities. Our vision is that we become a nation in which every local elected official is equipped uh, to lead, serve uh, an inclusive, thriving, and healthy community. Uh, and so for us, we acknowledge that race and equity is a large space to take on, so we need to really focus narrowly, and we've made a bold decision to focus specifically initially on racial equity. But racial equity is not about just black and white. Right? As we talk about race, the data doesn't lie. We know when we look at un whether it's employment, uh, whether we look at um, uh, education, whether we look at housing, or even the criminal justice system, we know that whether we're talking about black, Latino, Native Americans, a disproportionate number of, of our populations are significantly, uh, racial groups are significantly impacted. And so you heard Tim Wise talk about the different levels of racism, right? And so within that context, we're very mindful that real really speaks to leadership, that L part. Local elected officials play an important role to lead in this space, right? It, and so racism does exist at an individual and interpersonal level, but when we talk about racism, what we don't tend to talk enough about is institutional and structural racism. And so within that context, we're talking about policies, we're talking about procedures, we're talking about historically injustices that have been caused by systemic and institutional racism. And there's leadership needed. There's not a blame game that you're responsible but what do you do as a local elected official in that space to deal with institutional and structural racism and take on racial justice? That is critical in the framing of this conversation. That, that's a key term for us as we're talking about dealing with institutional and structural racism, dealing with racial justice, and the acknowledgement that as we talk about racial justice, not using just code words, right? Racial justice is not just talking about equity or talking about um, or equality, right? Racial justice is talking about equity, right? This diagram for me captured it in the most effective and compelling way that we could communicate this to our membership. The difference between equal and equality looks, lies right in that picture. Three people trying to watch a baseball game of different heights, trying to look over a fence, right? Equal means everybody gets the same thing to watch the game, but that doesn't mean everyone can watch the game. Equity is justice, is fairness. Right? What does everyone need? Rick Riordan's. Not everyone gets the same. They get what they need. Some people, that short dude, needs two boxes. The, the middle-sized dude needs one. The first one doesn't need a box. He can see the game just fine. 
right? There are a lot more in this picture you can talk about as you talk about system and, 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 and institutional justice in terms of why are they looking at the game outside the fence, right, if you wanted to go there, but that's a, I'm not going there right now. <laughs> Right? But as we're talking about the concept of understanding the difference between equality and equity, it's really important, right? And so that's the work as we build on the positive youth developments we're taking on uh, on this racial, racial equity work is really looking at the systems not being reactive but being proactive, being color brave. Melody Hobson, Google her YouTube, awesome YouTube video, being color brave, not being color blind, right? And understanding that while we're taking this on and while I've said a whole heck of a lot, uh, this is what we're dealing with. This is institutional structural racism, right? And it's a lot to talk about, but its implications are broad, right? And so this diagram reminds me of the American Disabilities Act, when they were fighting for uh, all the things they fought for, one, side, uh, curbs so they can be able to transition from, from sidewalk to sidewalk. The, it's broader implications, right? Who else benefits from the passing of ADA, American Disabilities Act? People that jog, people that bike, parents with kids. Right, equity has larger implications, right? It's not just, it's good for those people, right? Has a you know, great example of when you, when, you, when you talk about going to the bathroom, right? During a public setting, right? Uh, I heard this the other day, right? Bathroom setting, which lines are usually longer? Women's, right? And, and so when the guys are going, it's long, you know, the women's are longer and the guys are shorter, but sometimes who else is, and the guys are also waiting for their, you know, whether it's their wife, their spouse, their, their daughters, they're waiting too. Right, so addressing those issues have larger implications, right, about understanding why we're taking this work on, right? And at the end of the day, I want to leave you with this, and hopefully we have some time to have a conversation. I said a whole lot, but for me, I still go back to my frameworks. Everything I do is still kind of connected to simple frameworks, right, that I fight for, for in these communities, safe communities. That's important for mayors, elected officials. And we know as, they, as we fight for safe communities, that allows our young people to live healthier lives. Healthy lives mean that they can become better students if we meet their basic needs. Better students mean that they can uh, create uh, um, better communities for themselves. And better communities mean that they have a healthier future. And we all want them to have a healthier future. This is my healthier future. It's my family, right? This is the visual that I have. I wake up every morning, my urgency, my three daughters and my wife. That is my wife. She's not younger. She's not my child. <laughs> People think she's 12, right? But we all are fighting for that future, right? And as we see that, and that's important for us, that allows us to have that same sense of urgency. So appreciate the time. Well, hopefully we have some time to have some questions. My contact information, my Twitter handle is up there. Uh, definitely feel free to reach out to me. And uh, I'm definitely pretty quick on emails. So happy to take some questions if we have some time. Peace. Uh, so I wasn't here for the entire program, but I was here for when you said um, uh, that that piece about equity, and I and I want you to uh, want to know if you can explain more, like how this is an issue of racism, or like how using equity to combat the issue of racism doesn't just help uh, minority communities, how it better[s] us socio psychologically as a country, as a people, as a nation. Can you say more? Because I think there's a there's a point you want to make in a comment. So why don't you say what, where you're <laughs> so I can react to that. No, I mean, that, that's really it. I just want to know, like, how, like, you were using the example of uh, women uh, in their restrooms and things like that, of the ADA and, and things like that. I want to know how we use this policy, because often I have conversation with folks, and, like, I'm talking about racially, racially charged politics and things like that and, and equity for black communities. Um, and folks are just like, oh, you're also pro-black and anti-everything else. So I want to know, or, like, better understand myself, <laughs> how my yeah. viewpoints, uh, okay. which are similar to yours, uh, yeah. benefit the world. Got it. No, it's helpful. And um, one way I react to that, this is probably not the only way, probably have many other thoughts afterwards, but um, one of the things I've learned in the last several months since we've launched this new effort is the need to be explicit, right, about the conversation we're having. And I found for most of my career, our inability not to be explicit, right? And there's some good research out there uh, about when we're more explicit in the work, it leads to better progressive policies. We're afraid of being explicit, as Dr. Powell would talk about, because we think it creates this divisive wedge, when in fact it does the opposite. 
We tend not to talk about it, and it tends to lead to the uneven impacts. And so how can we talk more explicitly about what we're talking about? Is it racial equity? Is it gender equity? Is it income equity? What is it that we're calling out? And how do we um, acknowledge it in the room, acknowledge as we're talking about equity, the, the diagram shows, it's not talking about everyone getting the same thing. It's what do people need in that context, and, and how do we let data really drive the conversation? So I found myself showing up you know, with my membership. Again, I'm a diverse membership, 1,900 cities. It's mostly made up of, uh, um, while we work with all the large major cities, if you think about 19,000 cities, most cities are small towns, rural villages. Um, and so I work with people that look like Ferguson a lot. It, the city might be changing, but the leadership are older white men. And they show up at my conferences, right? And they're engaged. Uh, and they're great. I, I've enjoyed working with all of them. Right? This is hard conversations for them to have. They, many of them don't want to be a Ferguson. And so they need the space to be able to have the conversation, and they realize they need to have it. So are you creating the space for them? And how are you being explicit, giving them the tools uh, for them to know what it means to apply a racial equity lens as we're looking at policies, as we're looking at systems? It's not easy work. right? You got to be willing to be comfortable being uncomfortable which is a term, if you watch the Melody Hobson video, it's a great phrase she used, right? Uh, and so that, that's all a part of it. Uh, again, as I'm trying to answer your question quickly, but, uh, but there's probably a lot more to, to what you're asking. Uh, I'm, I'm with the City Youth Council, and um, what role, I have one question, uh, what role does the youth delegate play in black male achievement? The youth delegate in the National League of Cities? Yeah, National League of Cities. Uh, so just a little bit, were you one of the delegates? Oh, yeah. Awesome. So a little bit of context. Um, at the National League of Cities, we, at our annual conference, um, invite cities to bring youth to, uh, to our conference. So we um, have youth delegates from all across the country that actually serve in leadership roles in their city. I used to, before transitioning into this work, that was one of the things I loved. Looked, I, I used to direct and things I used to look forward to um, as part of my, uh, uh, my, our conference. So we get, usually get about 200 young people that show up. Um, and so the, their presence at our conference is important. They always bring a fresh perspective and the questions they ask. Uh, so their role is significant to your question. Um, you know, at the conference, our next conference is in Nashville next month. Uh, there will be a specific focus around understanding your bias. Uh, that our young people are leading, uh, understand, taking the bias test. How many folks have ever taken the, a bias test, a racial bias test, right? So we're going to be bringing that to our conference, right? And our young people have introduced that and want and are leading that. Um, and so their role is important there. But even as we do deal with this work and, and working with cities, their presence as, as key partners are, are spaces that are ongoing for us. So it's not a defined, narrow space as a person that comes passionate about young people having a voice. Uh, we're looking for more ways for young people to be integrated to the work that we're doing. So the verdict is still out in terms of what that will look like as we're moving forward with our real work. But thanks, thanks for being a, being a youth delegate. That's awesome. Hi. Um you mentioned briefly when you were going over the statistics on violence, um, Hispanic young men. As the Hispanic population in this country has increased, have you shifted your focus more to include Hispanic young men in this effort to increase black male achievement? Has that included some Hispanics, or have you mostly just focused on black male achievement? So it's not an either or question. Uh, it's a question we get often, right? But it is um, a little bit of context, to you, and I probably should have said it because in my presentation, because it is a question I get. The, the work that I've shown is work that we've done because we've been funded to be able to do, um, and it allowed us early on to have a chance to engage elected officials around this work. But this work has evolved significantly in the last five years. And so one of the spaces where it has evolved significantly is through the president's work, My Brother's Keeper initiative, which I didn't bring up in my presentation. But, you know, so from the Cities United work, there are 76 mayors, but we're working with the White House uh, around My Brother's Keeper, and there are over 180 communities, right, that were that are part of that. And the focus of the My Brother's Keeper is broadly framed as boys and men of color. Um, there's a whole body of a field out there with foundations that are existed, the Executive Alliance, uh, uh, which is made up of now over 40 foundations are investing in boys and men of color. Um, and so my reaction to it, it's not an either or 
piece, the data definitely drives the Cities United conversation. So I definitely showed from a data perspective, there's, there's not a need to frame a boys and men of color effort around Cities United when we know the disproportionate number of black men and boys are dying in streets across the country. It is a black man's issue. Not, well, let me rephrase it. The issue is about black men. It's not just black men to deal with it, right? Um, and so it's important to acknowledge that that's what we're talking about. And as we're being targeted about it, what do we do, right? And I, I get, you know, as we do with this work, there's things that will make people uncomfortable, but I also am very clear about when I need to be explicit, right? I'm not dodging the question when, it, when it's a Hispanic issue, it's a Hispanic issue. If it's a broader boys and men of color issue, then it's a broader boys and men of color. Let's not avoid being uncomfortable. Call it out. If it's black men, it's black men. If it's black women, it's black women. If it's Hispanic, if it's Asian, call it out. And it doesn't mean everybody. Don't, don't get academic on me. Like, well, it's not everybody. I know that. It ain't me. I understand that. Right? But I'm still impacted in my own community. I'm still impacted by it. So, and, so, and so are you. Are you seeing it? Understanding it is your issue, too. Right? So I think it's important to be explicit when we need to be, to be broad when we need to be, to also know that when we're talking about race, people tend to quickly gravitate to just being black and white, which is one of the slides I put up there. It's not just a black and white issue. It's a much broader issue. And be willing to build strategies understanding that it's, it's a complex need to think about how we engage in this work uh, using data to drive those strategies. But again, I thank you guys for uh, the opportunity for you to be able to present. Uh, hopefully, some of the stuff I said here was useful. Uh, look forward to I'll be around today for the rest of the conference and uh, hopefully part of tomorrow. And so if you feel free to reach out to me anytime and connect me by email. All right. Thanks so much.